Now it's still, it's still Christmas. We still have our Christmas tree up. It's Christmas tide. There's 12 days of Christmas. We're still in there. We're still celebrating. So it's still the holiday season. And the holiday season is filled with lots of wonderful traditions or experiences like traditions, such as expected gifts from expected people. Perhaps you always each year receive a fruit cake from distant relatives out of state who never have to face you for sending in a fruit cake. Maybe you get your favorite chocolates from your grandmother. Or I remember our, our nephews who are now adults when they were younger, they always exchanged with one another liters of soda. There were all these liters of soda under the tree, and they knew exactly who got one. It was an expected gift from an expected person. Now, my aunt owns a bookstore, and so for every Christmas, I would expect for the 38 of all of my Christmases that, that I probably have received books. And my mother and father receive books, and Josh receives books, and my children receive books. And some of the book themes are expected. Historical fiction for my dad, religion or cooking for me, fantasy trilogies for the older boys and for Josh, whatever they want him to think about specifically for that year. It's a, it's a very interesting, specific thing. These are expected books. But sometimes in these expected books from expected people, there can come unexpected knowledge. And sometimes from these books, even though we know what they're going to be about, we learn something new. And the story of Christ, the story of the Christ child is not new to many of us. Christmas is told everywhere we go. Christmas is told, the story is told through the lights we put on our houses, that the light of the world has come. And the evergreen of the trees that we decorate, that God was and is and is to come. And the nativity scenes that we place inside and outside of our homes, we, we tell the story of a birth of a baby and the formation of a family. And for us gathered here, we understand that this story is about Emmanuel, God with us, born of a, vir a virgin in Bethlehem. It can be so beautifully familiar, so comforting in its retelling, that sometimes we wonder if there's anything new to glean from this season that comes on the eve of a new year. The birth of Jesus and in its extraordinary circumstances, a virgin mother born during a business trip in the room where the animals were kept at night, were then followed by some very specific and expected customs, this unexpected story full of unlikely characters, comes to a conclusion in a very traditional way. Joseph and Mary made a sacrifice for the purification of the family following the birth of a male child. I'll read now from Leviticus 12, verses 2 through 8. Say to the Israelites, a woman who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son will be ceremonially unclean for seven days, just as she is unclean during her monthly period. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised, and then the woman must wait 33 days to be purified from birth. She must not touch anything sacred or go to the sanctuary until the days of purification are over. When the days of her purification for a son or daughter are over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. He shall offer them before the Lord to make atonement for her, and then she will be ceremonially clean from blood. These are the regulations for the woman who gives birth to a boy or a girl. But if she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make an atonement for her, and she will be clean." 
And this offering of Jesus to the Lord was in accordance to Exodus 13. They brought their firstborn son to the temple, and this is what it says in Exodus. The Lord says to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. In days to come, when your son asks you, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. And it will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the Lord has brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. There's so much to learn and understand in this passage in Luke this morning. And we're only a few sentences in. We just entered into the temple with Mary and Joseph and Jesus. We're just at the, at the door of the tent of meeting. And Joseph and Mary were of simple means. And so from what we learned in Leviticus, they offered what they could afford. They couldn't afford a lamb. They had the least expensive sin offering to a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And this is really interesting to us because Mary is a virgin mother, the the mother of the child of God, yet she is still of flesh, so she still makes an offering for the purification from the act of birth so interesting to think about that we helps us understand that God is indeed fully God and fully human. Mary and Joseph were faithful people. Knowing the wonder and the power and mystery of the, their baby son, they didn't think they were any different or special enough or, or recused from offering their son to the Lord or offering up animals for the sacrifice to be clean. We, in hindsight, see that God offering his firstborn son as the sacrifice for sin in the world is is apropos, is understandable. But here, Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to the temple to consecrate their son to the Lord in remembrance and honor of God bringing his people out of slavery in Egypt. Mary and Joseph began their journey of parenting Emmanuel in this interesting tension of both the holy and the ordinary. So in their faithful act, their act of tradition, of their faith, they meet Simeon, a prophet for just this occasion. Simeon was simply a devout man with a heart for peace and reunification of God's people. He desired the comfort and solace of the Israelites the consolation of God's people. And as the Holy Spirit led Simeon to the temple at that exact time, Mary and Joseph make room in their hearts for the unexpected and allow this older gentleman to take their babe in his arms and offer this. Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation for which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. Simeon knew this purpose, he knew this calling he had on his life, but he did not know when or how or what day, and it could have been any day. The expected could be fulfilled unexpectedly. His heart, Simeon's heart, was for God's love for God's people. But it is in his exhortation and fulfillment of his purpose and blessing, it is revealed that Christ is the Messiah for the Israelites, who will also shine a light of revelation onto the Gentiles and to all people. Now we know a baby changes everything. The birth of Christ set the world aright. The birth of a child reshapes our world and our lives. 
the world of parents and grandparents, even the community where the child is born. We make room in our physical spaces and in our hearts and in our thoughts. But I'm going to get to today's sermon title because I've learned in just three years of ministry that people pay attention to what you name your sermon titles and they want to know how does that connect with what you're talking about. So here's where we are. For example, today's title is called I Was Today Years Old. So literally today, and this was very fortuitous and thanks be to God for it, I was literally today when I learned that Today, in a lot of African-American churches, they will have a special service called Watch Night, where enslaved people gather together waiting for the strike of midnight. Because on September 22nd, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln had issued the executive order that declared enslaved people in the rebelling Confederate states were legally free. However, that decree that he made in September would not take effect until the clock struck midnight at the start of the year 1863. So this occasion, known as Watch Night or Freedom's Eve, marks when African Americans across the country watched and waited for the news of freedom. Now these were the people who happened to actually know that this decree happened. We have the holiday Juneteenth, which we celebrate because in Texas they didn't find out for about five years later in Galveston. But for those who were close to Abraham Lincoln or for those who were in the know, they gathered together in houses of worship and watched and waited to celebrate their freedom. Now thanks be to God that the lectionary brings together that good news found in Exodus of why Jesus is brought to the temple. Jesus is brought to the temple to consecrate the firstborn, to celebrate freedom from enslavement. And so it's very great that the Holy Spirit brought together that tradition that happens on New Year's Eve. And every three years, we tell the story of Jesus being consecrated in the temple to celebrate freedom from slavery. Frederick Douglass explains that Watch Night is a day for poetry and song, a new song. These are cloudless nights where the air is thick and the sun is brilliant and we are in harmony with the glorious morning of liberty that's about to dawn upon us. New life and new birth. Coming back to our gospel story, another example of I was today years old was I was today years old when I learned about the DNA. The DNA of each child that is born to their mother somehow grafts in and forever changes their mother's genetic makeup. And now it's not just the first child that is born, it's every child. With every child, a mother's DNA is forever changed. And I forgave myself quickly for not knowing or understanding this information because I've had five children. But this is a new human discovery, and that's all pretty much we know. All we know is that the DNA of each subsequent child changes forever, the DNA of the mother. But we don't fully understand the purpose or mechanics of this change, but we just know it to be true. So mothers indeed do carry their children with them forever and forever they are changed and our children are indeed and undeniably a part of us. So then that made me think when Simeon turns to Mary and says this child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and that a sword will pierce your own soul too. It is in scripture that this is directed specifically to Mary. Mary, who purified herself with a sin offering after the birth of Christ, would also somehow experience the weight and pain of her son's purpose and ministry in a unique way too. Now we know Mary herself is not God, but she carries a bond with her son that is unique unto itself. I mean, imagine 
trying to parent the Lord, your Savior. And as followers of Christ, we live our lives carrying the tension of the expected, the monotonous day-to-day, our routines and rhythms, and the miraculous, a faith beyond understanding and yet a tempered understanding of the world around us. And we pray and we gather and we worship and we fast and we sing, but we also pay our bills and clean our homes and carry on what at times can seem just a, a boring existence with a little light in our hearts that at any time God who is near to us could show up could show up in a flower blooming or a call from a friend or perhaps even a still small voice speaking into the quiet of an evening. We all live as Christians in this this existence that's both the expected and the unexpected. So as we approach the new year, my prayer and hope for you all and for myself is that we embrace and lean into more fully the light of revelation, that there can be holy in the ordinary, that we can find hope in our call to follow Christ, not just in the hope of the world to come and what is being made new, but of what could happen today. That the little light of mine and yours can grow and shine in a larger world that is chaotic and out of our control. Because we continue to gather and we continue to pray and worship and we continue to cook our meals and water our gardens and go to work and go to school. But we do all of these things in the light and the knowledge of Christ. Knowing what has been illuminated and revealed to us can appear before us just as it did for Anna the prophetess, just as it did for Mary and Joseph and Simeon and Simon Peter and Paul. And that perhaps we're today years old when we learn and understand that the holiness that dwells within us has changed us and is changing us. And then we can live each day in that light We can live each day in that light. And perhaps someone in your life will be today years old when they see the light of Christ in your life and understand that that can be theirs too. This we pray. Amen.